everyone for joining, uh, especially the second session in this series here. Uh, just quick housewarming, you should be muted. And as we're going along on this presentation, if you have any questions, put them in the chat box and we'll try to get to those all of your questions right at the end. And we want to be timely, so we'll get started here. Our internet today, unfortunately, has been a little glitchy, so I'll turn off my video, but it's great to see you all. And today we're going to be talking to you all about tomatoes. So I am Amanda Baird. I'm the Ag and Natural Resources Educator from Tipton County. And then my co coworker, or colleague, will be joining in, Krista Pullen, and she is the Ag and Natural Resources Educator from Cass County. So today with tomatoes, we're gonna be talking a little bit of you know, the background of tomatoes, some of the soil requirements, planting, looking at some of the insect issues we can get with tomatoes, as well as some of the diseases. And then at the very end, I'm gonna jump back on and I'm gonna show you about a very fun phone application that was created by Purdue University that you might find helpful. So, the information in this presentation, most of it is based off of a Purdue Extension publication called Tomatoes that was written by Rosie Lerner. And Rosie Lerner, I'm sure some of you or most of you know her, but she is the Extension Consumer Horticulture Specialist. And we will make sure that we link this, pres this Extension publication in the chat box as well as get it emailed out to all of you that are viewing today. Now, when we look at the history of tomatoes, I always think that it's very interesting to find out where they come from. Where do these plants come from, these vegetables and fruits that we're using every day in our household? Well, tomatoes are actually native to South America, and then they were introduced to Europe, specifically, you know, um, France as well as Italy, and we see a lot of that cuisine in their dishes. And what's really fun is when they were introduced by these early explorers, the tomato was called the apple of love. So that was the nickname that they had for the tomato. And Thomas Jefferson grew tomatoes in 1781 for his guests, but tomatoes were not cultivated widely in the U.S until around 1835, because people actually believed it to be poisonous. But of course we know that tomatoes are a very nutritious snack. I mean, one medium-sized tomato provides us most of our vitamin C, our vitamin A, iron, and it's only 35 calories. Tomatoes are gonna be classified according to their growth habit. So we have our determinate tomatoes and our indeterminate tomatoes. When we look at our determinate tomatoes, those are going to reach a specific height that's determined by their genetic makeup. So they're going to reach a specific height and then they're gonna stop growing. Mostly you might've heard of these as a bush variety. Then when they reach this height, they start to produce the cluster of flowers at their growing tip. And those flowers along that stem will set fruit within a couple of weeks. So because you're gonna have these fruit within two, three weeks, they're really gonna come on, you're gonna get a lot of tomatoes. These determinate varieties are gonna be really good for canning and sauce making. So you think of your Roma tomatoes, your paste tomatoes, most of those are gonna be your determinants. Now we have our indeterminate tomatoes. These are the ones that are gonna to continue to increase in height throughout the growing season. You might've heard of the indeterminate tomatoes as the vining tomato. Um, lots of growth, they'll just keep growing, they'll increase in height. You, these are usually ones that you have to make sure you're staking well. And what happens here is that the stem continues to produce a lot of that foliar growth or all of those leaves rather than set flowers. So it gets really big at first. And then the fruit and the flowers 
are produced throughout the season along the side shoots of the tomato. So kind of how the tomato plant, kind of how you can see here in this photo. These are gonna be a really good option if you want to spread out that harvest over a longer period of time. So if you wanna have those great tomatoes throughout the growing season, then your indeterminate tomatoes, that would be the choice for you. Some of the most popular tomatoes to grow are the indeterminates. So not calling out a certain variety over another, but you might have heard of the beef steaks, big boys, brandy wine, or even some of those early growing tomatoes such as early girl. Most of those are going to be your indeterminates. And if you're wondering, well, how can I tell? It should be on the plant label. So you should be able to see that on the plant label that if it's an indeterminate or a determinate tomato. Now, we know that tomatoes grow in numerous different places. We have tomatoes in Northern United States, we have them in Southern United States. But if a tomato plant had an ideal growing condition of the soil, the perfect soil condition for a tomato, would be a deep, loamy, well-drained soils. Tomato plants, they don't like sitting in water. They don't like wet feet. That's how you get a lot of those disease issues that we see with tomatoes. And the soil would be just slightly acidic, so we'd have a pH of a 6.2 or a 6.8. Now we should always be remembering to take a soil test, and we take those soil tests, you know, in our gardens every three years. However, the general fertilizer recommendation through Purdue University is going to be to apply two to three pounds of a complete fertilizer, uh, such as a 10-10-10 or a 5-10-5, and that would be per 100 square feet of that garden area. And you'll want to make sure that you're working that soil in so that you're working that in with the topsoil and you're not just spreading it out on top. Tomatoes are one of the crops that you have to be careful with with your nitrogen. So if you are using a really high nitrogen, um, we don't want to use any of like the lawn fertilizers that can be high in nitrogen because if you put too much nitrogen, those tomato plants will produce such luxurious foliage, but it's going to delay your flowering and your fruiting. So you'll have beautiful leaves and it will be all large and lush, but you'll delay your flowering and potentially even fruiting. When we look at tomato planting, uh, most people in all areas are not going to direct seed a tomato plant. So these are gonna be started within your house um, before we're going to plant those outside and they're commonly transplanted. Tomato plants love sun. So this is one of our warm season crops that are gonna need at least a minimum of six hours of sunlight, but it can use even more. So eight hours, sunlight is definitely ideal for these crops. And one interesting thing about tomatoes that I will admit when I first started growing them, I did not know, but tomatoes will root along the stem when it's in contact with soil. So what you wanna do when you're planting those outside is you want to plant them a little bit deeper. You don't get that tomato plant, pull it out and just cover the roots. Put some of that stem in and plant that in so that you can set them deeper so that the plant will be anchored, it'll produce more roots, and it'll help stabilize that tomato plant, especially since we know that they get very lush, they can have a lot of vines, and they can get heavy. So we wanna have a good root system. Hey Amanda, we have a question. Oh, yes. Is it okay to not apply any fertilizer to the tomato plant if they are grown in a homemade compost? Yes, thank you for that question. Um, it's a very interesting question because I couldn't really tell you yes or no without knowing the breakdown of that compost. 
Um, specific compost, especially whether what you're adding into it or if you're using a compost that also has animal manure in it. So some of those manures have different ratios of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, uh, the NPK. So the best advice I can give you is how are your plants looking? Are they lush? Are they green? Are they producing tomatoes like you want them to? Or do you see yellowing in your leaves, which might mean that you have an a nitrogen deficiency? Are you seeing purpling in your leaves, which might mean that you're having a deficiency? Uh, you can, you know, if your compost is mixed in with your top soil, you can potentially also get a soil test for that uh, so that you can see some of them, not nitrogen, but you can see some of those um, nutrients and see how they're stacking up in your home garden. But it's all going to be up to what your plants look like. So if they're healthy, then it, sh it looks like it's working for you. But getting back here, um, one thing that I really like to stress to all, all homeowners, all gardeners, all master gardeners, is that when we are trying to look at the different varieties and the different plants that we're wanting to plant, look at what diseases are most common and then try to find disease resistant cultivars. And the best thing about tomatoes is that there are these cultivars that are already out there for some of the common diseases. So this is a plant label here that you see on the screen, and this is for a big beef variety. So it's an indeterminate, and all I wanted to show you on this plant label, so if you were to go and buy these seeds, this is for seeds, as that on the screen here, you can see disease resistant codes. So cultivars that have resistance to certain diseases, they'll be denoted by a letter. And here we see that it has a high resistance to a stem canker disease. It has a high resistance to um, Fusarium wilt, um, two different versions and strands of that wilt. The GLS there stands for gray leaf spot. And it also has a verticillium wilt, it's resistant, and tobacco mosaic virus. So the more that we can plant at least some resistance in these varieties, the less issues we'll have in our garden, the less we'd have to apply a potential fungicide um, in our garden as well, and the healthier our plants would be, which is gonna be really important, especially with tomatoes, because as we're about to find out, and I'll switch it over to Krista, my colleague, is that tomatoes have very common insect and disease problems. All right, I'm also gonna keep my, um, my, my video. I'll turn it on here for just a second though and say hi, introduce myself. I am Krista, I'm with the uh, Cass County Extension Office. So we're gonna move in now to talk about some common insect and disease problems um, that we face with, um, with tomatoes. And um, so it looks like for insects, we have three main insect problems that, that we deal with that are very common. And so um, we're thinking more like tomato hornworm, tomato fruitworm, and stink bugs. Now aphids are also, um, they can also be a problem, but um, and sometimes we might have cutworms or armyworms that fly in, but these three are the most common insect issues we see almost every year. Now early blight is um, one of those diseases that is also very common. So when we think about diseases, we also think about um, some others like uh, verticillium wilt, but a lot of our varieties, like Amanda was saying, they are um, breeding this, they're more resistant to those. So those diseases don't seem to be as big of a problem for us as they have been in, in previous years. Um, but that's not to say that we don't still see them because we do. Um, so what we're looking at now is we're really starting to see a lot of bacterial diseases that are on the rise um, and um, less of those um, issues that we had um, in the past. So we're going, to, um, we're going to talk a little bit about identification today and causes of many of these diseases. But as far as control recommendations, I'm going to refer you to the Midwest Vegetable Production Guide for commercial growers. 
um, and one of my colleagues is going to share that link here in the chat box, um, but it has different recommendations and is a very valuable resource um, and it is free. Um, but it has a lot of um, weed control and disease control and insect control um, recommendations in there. So tomato hornworm is one of the most well-known garden pests. So most of the time what we're going to see is defoliation before we see any fruit damage. And they need to be controlled because as many of you know that have had tomato hornworms, um, they can be totally devastating in a pretty quick, um, pretty quick time frame. So they only have one generation in a season, and that's good news for us because that makes, um, that makes them relatively easy to control. So once we know we have them, we know to, <clears throat> excuse me, to look for those hornworms. Um, and uh, because of how quickly they can destroy our plants in our garden, we need to, um, it just makes it more apparent of, of the need to do those daily walkthroughs our garden and just make some observations about what's going on out there. Um, I can tell a, a situation I had, I went on a family vacation towards the end of July and I had my sister who doesn't garden was supposed to kind of be, you know, keeping an eye on my garden. And uh, I came back and I said, what happened to my tomatoes? And she said, I don't know, I watered them. And she's just not familiar with uh, gardening. But what had happened was I had a couple tomato hornworms in there. And um, in a matter of a couple days, um, several of, <clears throat> if not all of my plants, um, thinking back, were completely devastated. So tomato fruit worm is another insect that um, is, is very common in our garden. And it's actually an insect that has two different names depending on what it is feeding on. So it's often, um, when we're talking about tomatoes, we call it the tomato fruit worm. Um, and then when it feeds, it can also feed on uh, sweet corn. And in that case, it's called the corn earworm. Um, but it is the exact same insect. Um, you can see definitely a different feeding pattern than the tomato worm. Uh, the tomato fruit worm really works on boring down into that core, making a, a pretty big mess of the fruit. So another, another favorite pest, or not favorite pest, I should say, is the stink bug. Um, and they do uh, quite a bit of damage to our tomatoes too. So sometimes people get confused and even here when people bring some tomatoes to my office, I can um, sometimes have to give it a second thought, but um, it can look like a virus issue. But when we see this yellow piffing or the coring in the fruit, that's, that's a sign that a stink bug is actually doing some feeding on that fruit. So early blight, this is a disease that unfortunately is very common for um, people raising tomatoes and especially for home gardeners. Uh, it's that it's got very distinct characteristics. It's known for starting at the bottom of the plant. Um, you start to see that the leaves are dying off and defoliating. And we also see that the fruit is starting to try to ripen. Um, and it's trying to keep moving forward in the reproductive cycle of the plant. But that disease uh, works its way slowly to the top of the plant. So when you see the plant get to this point, like you're looking at here, especially in that left hand, pic left -hand side picture, um, there's not a whole lot to save. So as far as that fruit is, is about as far as it's gonna get. It's, it's probably not gonna ripen up much more than that. Um, and this, when we start to see this early blight come on, and you'll start noticing it, but just, um, just small little black speckled dots on the bottom of those, those bottom leaves. So we wanna keep an eye on those plants throughout the year. And um, you look in that spray guide and see what you need to be doing. And we wanna be preventive and proactive for early blight because we can slow that process and even, even partially stop, stop it from getting any worse when we first see those signs. All right, and so we'll move on to bacterial diseases. There's three different bacterial diseases that are pretty common. Um, here in the picture we have bacterial spot is on the left, bacterial speck is in the middle, and bacterial canker is on the right. On canker, the injury on the fruit is actually raised up off the fruit. So if you run your hand over that fruit, you're gonna feel, you're gonna feel those bumps. On bacterial speck and spot, the markings on the fruit are actually indentions into that fruit. And you know, it's fairly easy to, to see the difference here when we have them all laid out together side by side. But at first thought, when you're, when you're first looking at your plants, you might 
um, it, it's not as obvious sometimes. So, um, you know, refer back to um, this picture or, you know, you might have to take a second look and compare these three bacterial diseases, um, you know, online or, or with um, this app that we're going to show you here later um, to make sure that you know what, what you got there. So as the name suggests, the bacterial speck infection sites are small. So they're a lot smaller than the bacterial spot. So that's an easy way to remember it. So there's always other problems, of course, that you're going to face with tomatoes. So um, as we talked a little bit earlier, you could have nu nutrient deficiencies, uh, fluctuation in moisture um, is also common in tomatoes, just as it is almost all of our garden plants. Um, unfavorable conditions during pollination, so it could be too wet, too hot. Um, genetics also always plays a, a factor. And um, then, of course, we always have room for human error. All right, so yellow shoulder is something that um, is, is pretty common. And in fact, uh, usually somebody will call into my office and say, um, you know, I have these tomatoes and it'll be probably, usually it's around late August. And they said, I've been watching them all summer and they just will not ripen. Um, we talk about planting dates at that point and usually, you know, they plant them, you know, mid to late spring or sometimes even early spring. But what they actually have going on here is this yellow shoulder disorder. And it's, it's caused by a deficiency in potassium. Um, it also has some environmental conditions that play a part in this disorder. It's one that's researched quite a bit because researchers still are not 100% sure why this disorder occurs. But they do know that it has something to do with that potassium deficiency and environmental conditions. And so they both play a significant role in the development of this disorder um, and uh, they kind of play hand in hand. So sometimes the disorder doesn't present as prominently as it does, as it does here in this um, picture. Um, but it still causes yellowing of the wall itself. So um, if, if you're a home gardener, you could, um, if you don't have a fruit that's, that's totally affected, you could cut out some of those parts and see, you know, what the inside looks like. If you don't have any of that yellow cell um, on the inside, maybe at the bottom of the tomato, it's still sal salvageable. Um, these tomatoes probably are not one that you're going to be able to sell at a market. Um, there might be somebody who's interested in just getting some canners and they might be able to, you know, salvage some of uh, the tomato and they might be willing to pay, you know, do that for a discounted price. Um, but like I said, if these were my own tomato and I didn't have too bad of a condition, I would cut out the bad parts and just use the rest because there's nothing um, actually wrong with the taste of the fruit um, um, on those unaffected areas. So very similar to yellow shoulder is a condition called green shoulder. And this disorder is one that tends to be more of a variety or a cultivar issue. So uh, like the yellow shoulder, that greenness is never going to ripen out. And these shoulders are going to stay that color and that tissue underneath also won't ripen. Um, it won't ripen out. So that tomato um, can get to the point that it's, um, will, will be unusable. So when I say uh, shoulder, for both of the yellow shoulder and the green shoulder, um, you, it tends to be the top part of the tomato that's affected the most. Sometimes it takes over the whole tomato, um, but it can be all different, different areas of that tomato. So that, that name's a little bit deceiving, but it is most commonly that top part, which is known as the shoulder. So fortunately, we are starting to see less and less of green shoulder. There's something that tomato breeders, it's something that they've been working on to minimize with these new cultivars and varieties that they're working on. And so blossom end rot, that's another one that is very common. Um, most of you, if not all of you have seen this. So it's caused um, from a calcium deficiency and it happens when the plant's nutrient and water uptake system becomes inconsistent. And so when that happens, we don't have calcium reaching all of the fruit tissue down at the blossom end. And so the early stages start with that white discoloration at the bottom end where the cell walls don't have the ability to just stay that firm and firm, um, 
feeling and have that shape or keep that shape because there's not enough calcium in it. And as the tomato continues to ripen, that tomato does not have enough calcium to maintain that shape and integrity. So then it starts to sag and rot in on itself. So while to the eye this looks like a disease, the cause of this is not actually the disease itself. It's, it's, it's truly from being calcium deficient. And by having more consistent moisture available to the plant, we actually can help reduce this condition. So sometimes we do see that certain cultivars seem to be more susceptible to this than others. Um, so if that's something that you um, tend to struggle with, um, maybe not having enough uh, calcium in your soil, you might um, always do that soil test and make amendments to your soil as needed, but um, it also might be a, an opportunity where you want to select um, certain cultivars that are resistant to this condition. All right, so cracking. Cracking is so frustrating because it can be one of those where your tomatoes are looking just almost pristine and perfect in the next um, next few days you come to check them and you start to notice that this condition um, is happening and so it's it's very related to environment um, effects and so we tend to see a lot of cracking when we've got dry conditions for a majority of the growing season um, and so um, you know we are able to control uh, the amount of moisture we see a little bit better um, or that we experience a little bit better when we have dry, uh, dry seasons, a dry summer, because we can control the amount of water we're putting on them. Um, but sometimes, um, well, usually, we'll have an ex a, a day where we see, just receive a, a ton of rain in a short amount of time, and that we can't control. So when we get that amount of moisture when it's been dry, um, the plant will take up so much water that the cells can't keep up with expanding of the fruit. And the skin actually just begins to crack and tear as that fruit starts to swell from taking up that water. So this is why when, we're, when we are the ones doing the watering in these dry seasons, it's important to you know, set a timer on your phone or get one of the um, spigot timers that you can use. So you don't accidentally leave the sprinkler on longer than you intend to or even overnight because that's um, definitely when this, you're gonna start seeing this condition. All right, zippering. This one occurs during pollination. And what you're actually seeing is a section of the pollen tube that didn't receive the pollen. And it's basically just a cosmetic problem. There's nothing wrong with the actual fruit. It can still be usable. Um, it's just, it just has very distinct physical characteristics. Another one that if you have never seen it, it can be um, kind of, um, unsightly is called cat facing and it's also a pollination issue so it can it can occur if it's too hot or too wet and these conditions cause a different type of scarring and deformity of the fruit Another condition I want to talk about today is called weather checking. And we see a lot of this if we have several mornings or days of heavy dew that sets on that fruit and doesn't dry off until late in the morning. And so you'll see this here coming up in the next few weeks um, and into the next month where um, we start to have a lot more dew and cooler nights and cooler mornings and um, that water doesn't, that moisture doesn't evaporate off that skin very fast. So when that moisture um, and that water stays on the skin of the fruit, it actually causes that spinning that you're seeing in the pictures. And um, it just, um, you start to see the kind of a discoloration or a duller colored fruit. Um, and then definitely those small, um, small circular cracks around that shoulder. Okay, physiological leaf roll is uh, another pretty common um, issue we face with tomatoes. And when you see this, there, it can cause, um, it can cause some, some, some concern, but there's actually nothing wrong with this plant at all. It typically occurs after you prune the suckers, so we tend to probably see more of it on those determinate plants. Now I threw this picture in there because sometimes herbicide injury can look a lot like a disease. So this is a picture of glyphosate 
glyphosate injury. And if you're, curi if you're curious if you have this injury, look down into the new growth points. If you start to see yellowing in those areas, then there's a good possibility that you have glyphosate injury. As far as weed management, you know, if, if, if it's a you know, you've been um, trying to manage some other weeds on your property. Um, again, I'm going to refer you to that Midwest Vegetable Guide because there's a lot of recommendations on um, how to control some weeds in your garden and um, in surrounding areas in there. But we do want to be careful with that Roundup because it can be, um, it, it can damage your plants. All right, so things that, um, Things that increase ripening are um, warmer temperatures. So, right, um, you know, July and August, we really see that our tomatoes really start to ripen up quickly. Um, now, we can get too warm. So, if we have weeks where, um, or a week or so, where, you know, we're talking 100 degree temperatures or more, um, now you might start noticing that. Um, Per, um, ripening has slowed down, but typically July and August, we really see um, an increase in our tomato production. When we have tomatoes that we've planted for a fall crop, a lot of times um, as those fall temps start to drop, our third and fourth clusters might stay green because they just aren't getting those long days of warm temperatures anymore. And so it's just going to take um, a, a longer time um, if, they, if they turn at all. So uh, stress to plant can also um, increase ripening speeds. So we talked about shoot pruning or the sucker pruning. And one of the reasons why we sucker prune is to speed up that ripening process on that first cluster of tomatoes. So uh, if root pruning happens to be done, uh, that can also cause stress. If we are running our tiller through and we get too close to the roots, we might inadvertently do some repruning. Um, and then when that happens, we might also see fruit on the plant start to ripen quicker. So um, if we stress the plant with um, reduction of irrigation, uh, then we might also see ripening coming on quicker. Um, what we want to make sure to avoid is the excessive use of nitrogen fertilizer. And Amanda talked about that earlier, but um, once again, that does cause um, all of the energy um, that the plant is producing, it's going right back into that vegetation. So we want all of that energy to go towards fruit production. So I want to reinforce that, that that nitrogen, um, we don't want to over, over fertilize. Great, thank you so much. So as you saw, there are numerous diseases and insects and issues um, that you can have with your tomatoes. And it can seem really overwhelming. And one cool tool that I really wanted to talk to you guys about is the Purdue Tomato Doctor. This is an app for your cell phone or an iPad if you have one. And the app is available on most platforms and it costs 99 cents. Now this Tomato Doctor covers more than 80 insect, disease, and environmental problems. Those environmental problems being yellow shoulder, green shoulder that we just learned about, zippering. And it includes over 500 high quality images so that you can use this app and look at the different photos and try to link up what your plants are doing. Now let's walk through an example here. So the photo on this page Right here, this is what the main app looks like when you click on it. But when you have it on your cell phone, what you're going to be looking for once you've downloaded the app is that tomato there where the arrow is at. So it's a tomato, it has the Purdue logo in the bottom, and it says Tomato Doctor. But this is my cell phone, and as you can see, there's some other Purdue apps on there. So just a quick plug for those other apps. There's the Turf Doctor, so if you have issues in your lawn, uh, diseases, insects, environmental problems, that's all about the lawn. There's a perennial one, so we can, um, you can look at different perennial issues that you might be having on your flowers. And there's also the tree doctor. The great thing about this is now you have a, a resource on your phone. You can get all four of those apps and it doesn't even cost you $5. So when we click into the app, we click on the tomato, the first thing that's going to pop up is the screen 
and it's going to allow you to use the app in a couple different ways. So you can look by parts of the tomato or you can look by problems. So say, because Krista just told us all about some of these diseases, so say you know that you have early blight or you already know that you have a hornworm or aphids, but because there's so many, you can't remember exactly the control methods. Well, you can go on here, you can click the disease button and then find early blight. It'll tell you about that disease. It'll tell you also how to control it. Or for the insects, you would click on the insects and it would tell you the methods for control. Now the other here, how it says other, that's gonna be the environmental issues. So, you know, it, if it's uh, the yellow shouldering, green shouldering, that's would be under the other tab. Now for this example though, we are going to pretend like we don't know what is happening and we're gonna search by the part of the tomato. So this is the next screen. So we're searching by the parts. We can look at the fruit, the leaves, stems, the roots, or the flowers. Or if you really wanted to, you could go through all problems, but you will be having a lot of different photos, almost those 500 photos to go through. So we're going to look at leaves for this example. We noticed that we have some issue with the leaves on our tomato plant. So what I did here and what you would see on the app when you have it is here up here we see three of 70. So I started at one, I have my tomato leaf in front of me or I'm out in my garden looking at my plant and then I'm scrolling through my phone and I'm using these tabs down here at the bottom, really simple to use to try to match up with what my plant looks like with this great resource. So I am pretty positive that my leaf now looks like this here. So it says down here, it's septoria leaf spot, and then it can cause my plant to lose its leaves. Well, what can I do about this, if anything? Because some of these you wouldn't be able to have a control method for. So what we do now is up here, we are gonna click on more information. Now we come to this screen on the more information. So we have septoria leaf spot up here. Key features, small spots that grow together. They're really small spots. And oh no, it's very common in the Midwest. You can click on this here. It'll take you to useful links. So whether those are Purdue Extension publications or other extension publications about septoria leaf spot. But then also down here at the bottom, you know, we're seeing some different pictures. Kind of hard to see, I will admit. But there's a button here that says damage, there's a button here that says stages, and there's a button here that says control. So let's click on the damage button first. So when we click on the damage button first, we can see all of the details about this disease. So it's similar like early blight. Older leaves are the first to show these symptoms. However, the lesions on the leaf are going to be darker, have gray centers, showing us more photos down at the bottom. We can click on those photos too to make them larger. And it even tells us that if we have a simple um, hand lens that we can potentially see the dark fungal structures can be seen in the center of those lesions. So we can be looking at our leaf and seeing if we're now seeing those lesions and seeing if we can see those fungal structures. So now we're pretty sure we used our hand lens, we saw the fungal structures, we're pretty sure that this is the disease we have with our tomato plant. We go down here and we can look at control. Is there anything I can do? So control. Now there's two separate things here. It gives us a little um, paragraph that says rotate crops three to four years before planting tomatoes again. We're gonna make sure that when once we see that disease, either in the fall, if it's not too severe, but if it is severe, you know, remove those plants um, from the field or till them in. Now, um, the lower branches, so if you start to see that disease on those older leaves, like it said, we can start removing some of those leaves because that would help, as it says, reduce the infected tissue and increase airflow, which will be important. Now, 
One other thing with a lot of these diseases that's really important to point out is that when we want to rotate crops three to four years before planting there again, it's definitely talking about all the crops that would be in the same family as tomatoes. Uh, so whether that's going to be, I believe some of your potatoes, um, I correct me if I'm wrong group, but I think that green peppers are potentially in the nightshade family, which is what tomatoes are. So those are all going to be things that we're going to make sure we're rotating and not putting back in the same spots. And if the disease is not super severe at this point, if we're just noticing a little bit of the lower branches, there are some um, effective pesticides that you can use. So it lists two here, and these are the active ingredients. So when you're at the store and you're looking at the different products, that would be a fungicide in this case, make sure that one of these two active ingredients is on that main label and it'll say it there. So I really love using that app. I think that it's a neat app and it'll help you and show you how to look at the different diseases, look at the different insects. Um, you can also use the Midwest Vegetable Production Guide that Krista had stated because that is a free resource. But if you are able to get the app that costs 99 cents, this is a specific to tomatoes and it will help you answer a lot of questions that you have. Uh, we really appreciate you guys joining us today for this uh, second series and we would love to finish up some questions if we have any of those in the chat box. Hey, this is Stephanie. Um, we did have some come across the chat box and I think Adam's answered a couple of them as we go. Um, but what causes early blight? Ah, early blight. So um, a lot of times, so that's a, it's caused by a bacteria. And a lot of times what happens is um, it's either rain or water will splash, you know, hit the soil and splash up. And there's several different causes of it. So feel free to chime in, Amanda, too. But uh, the, the water contact will splash, you know, hit the soil and splash up on those bottom leaves, which is why you start to see it happening on the bottom leaves first. Um, so things that you can do is, you know, keep an eye on those leaves when you start seeing those little, um, small little black dots, that's the very start of it. And so you might trim or prune a, a few of those leaves off. You don't want those leaves touching the soil. So um, you can kind of help prevent it before it even starts by if you have a, a foliage that's directly in contact with the soil, I go ahead and prune those off in my garden. Another thing um, that helps is instead of watering overhead with the sprinkler system, uh, drip irrigation or, uh, you know, taking a watering can and, and watering just down at the root level instead of having that water drip from top to bottom of the, of the foliage. Um, at the year end, you want to make sure you take all of the um, infected plants and, and probably all of your plants out of the garden um, that have that disease. Um, and you want to make sure you get rid of them because they can overwinter or that disease can overwinter and that bacteria can be, you know, present again in your soil um, the following year. Okay, the next question. I know you guys kind of touched on um, looking at the labels and you'll be able to kind of see what diseases they might be more resistant to. But are there any certain tomato varieties that are more susceptible to yellow shoulder or green shoulder? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so I was actually looking that up when Krista was giving her presentation because, you know, you see everything and all the extension publications up that it can be varieties. And actually, <laughs> so they all say that. And then the only things I could see as far as which ones are potentially uh, more likely to get it. Um, so heirloom tomatoes, some of the larger heirloom tomatoes are more prone to green and yellow shouldering. Uh, especially like the Cherokee purples, um, those get green shoulders, but that's actually kind of normal for that variety. But they do have um, that the heirloom, heirloom are more prone. And then as far as ones to potentially plant less susceptible, it says the uniform green gene. Now, I would think that that would be on a plant label. Off the top of my head, I can't think of a specific tomato variety that has the uniform green gene, 
but that are that those are two that are coming out of the university as saying that are more prone and less susceptible. The next question was, how can I prevent leaf spot going into next year? Yeah, you guys did a great job covering that. Uh, Catherine said that answered her question. Was that about leaf spot? Yeah. Okay. I did see another question come in about the compost. Well, compost cover also help with the water droplets leaping back up to the soil leaves, and that is um, that was another recommendation is using um, you know ground covers. Um, or compost covers there between um, plants and you know down aisles that would help with that. We'll go ahead and get any last questions in if you have any for us. And thanks for the questions so far. Those were great. What are your thoughts on open pollinated versus hybrid varieties? I personally probably have to look into that because I don't have too much of a preference or a say as far as um, that. I don't know if anyone else, any other educators wanted to chime in on those. I mean, I will say on that, that a lot of the open pollinated ones, of course, being the heirloom varieties. Um, I mean, I grow both heirloom and non heirloom in my garden. And I think that it's more of a personal preference because heirloom, you can get some pretty unique varieties. Or I would say um, you can get some pretty unique tomatoes in a sense. So you can get like all purple ones or all, um, I have one that's called a blue bunny and it has blue and it's kind of like a cherry versus grape tomato. Um, so yeah, that's just my thoughts on them. Another question that popped up was, do you guys have any special advice for container gardening um, if you don't have the ground space to do tomatoes in some kind of container? Yeah, container gardening is actually great for tomatoes. Um, my pieces of advice would be make sure you always have adequate drainage at the bottom. Um, so a lot of those containers that you can purchase even at, you know, nurseries and, and box stores do not already have um, the holes in the bottom. So um, sometimes they'll have a spot for the hole, but you have to actually take a drill and, um, you know, just poke through. Um, another suggestion is, uh, keep in mind that you're still, you know, that plant's going to be pretty high off the ground, so you're still going to need some kind of staking or, um, you know, something to hold it up. So, you know, when, when we get a little bit of wind or, you know, they get a little weight with those tomato uh, fruit that um, it's not, you know, toppling over. But there's, um, there's a lot of um, people have great success with container, um, container gardening with tomatoes. Yeah, and there's actually I think you might have mentioned it, but so many new types coming out that specifically say patio tomato, container tomato. Um, so those would be great varieties. Um, there's even, I've seen some dwarf, dwarf tomatoes and they don't even get very big. They're like two feet as the max height on those guys. And they do produce a, a cherry tomato on them, but those are gonna be great because you can put like a larger one, uh, some of the larger patios in a bigger container, or if you even have just a really small container, you could still get some of those cherry tomatoes on those micro dwarf or even dwarf tomato plants. 
Another question, is there a cross variety of determinate and indeterminate? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, a cross variety. I mean, I don't know if it's necessarily a cross variety, but I'm sure there are varieties out there that are not the extreme vining like some can be. Um, if you put your email in the chat box, I'm happy to look that up for you and get some more information. I just don't know that off the top of my head. I have another question. It's mid uh, middle of August. Should we start to prepare tomato plants for the end of the season? Like cut off flowers so it can send energy to help the fruit ripen. That's a good question. Um, you know, it's going to depend year to year. Some, some Augusts are still very, very hot. And I think this year, at least the last week or two, we've had some cooler, uh, cooler days and definitely cooler nights. So it is, it is probably time to start thinking about, um, you know, getting your harvest, harvest um, off and those tomatoes are going to start ripening quite a bit slower. So um, as far as cutting off the flowers, um, yeah, that always does help send more energy to the fruit. Um, so, um, you know, if you already think you have enough um, of, of produce and stuff um, that's currently growing, getting ready to harvest, um, that would definitely help send some more energy to that fruit. Yeah, I would agree with that. I'm, the biggest thing is when we get into some of those fall months, if there's a frost that's forecasted, you know, go out there and take off those tomatoes, including the green ones, because they can ripen, will ripen off the vine. I think I always forget as a gardener, you know, I want those tomatoes to be ripe and on the vine, but if the longer they're on the vine, the more susceptible, like we learn to cracking and sun scold and all of those, dis those environmental issues. So you can take them off, even though they're a little pink or green, and put them in the house and have them ripen. All right. Well, thank you everyone again for joining. Um, we'll be back here on next Tuesday. Yep. I always forget what day it was there. And uh, for our next series, so hopefully you'll be joining us for that. I saw the email from Patty, so I'll get you the information that you were asking for and have a great rest of your week.